Hello and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. Megan Maloney is a devoted lover of New Zealand. She expresses her deep passion for the country through captivating landscape photography. Her journey began with a family blog, evolving into a profound connection with the outdoors. Relocating from Wellington to Cambridge in 2015, Megan explored the Waikato, Bay of Plenty and Coromandel, uncovering hidden gems. Enthusiastic about sunrises, sunsets, waterfalls and reflections, she's traversed the length of New Zealand from Northland to the Catlins to share the essence of the land. As a Sony New Zealand digital imaging advocate, Megan collaborates with Sony to build a community of photographers offering landscape photography workshops and events. Her ultimate goal is to inspire others to experience the beauty of these locations and enhance their landscape photography skills for breathtaking images. In this episode, we discuss the story of her photography journey from being a blogging mum to a full-time professional landscape photographer. Sharing her experiences trekking and travelling, Megan discusses setting personal and professional goals, learning through patience and failure, and the importance of embracing and adapting to technical changes in the field. Megan also touches on keeping a healthy balance between work, photography and family life, and provides insightful advice to new photographers. I hope you enjoy the show. G'day Megan, welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? I am going good, thanks, Grant. Thanks so much for inviting me to be on the show. Thank you for agreeing to be on the show. It's uh, wonderful to have you. Uh, definitely been a follower of yours for some time and really admire your work. Why don't you talk to me a little bit about why you started in landscape photography in particular, but photography in general as well? Yes, yeah, I've got two boys who are teenagers now, and when we were living in Wellington a few years back, picked up a camera really just to start vlogging, to take pictures of the kids and to share that with our family who live, who were living sort of six or seven hours drive away and also on the other side of the world. So I would write these weekly blogs and the kids would appear and quite often we'd be out having little adventures in the around the Wellington region. But I quite quickly came to realise that I actually preferred just taking photos of the landscape. So I could take or leave the photos of the kids, poor children. And yeah, just grew from there really. And I was a I was a little bit I had a I had a job where I had a lot of creative kind of brain space free and it naturally just morphed into learning a bit more about the landscapes and wanting to just be out in that sort of first moment of sunrise and yeah so it was a bit of a progression really over a period of a few years but yeah these days I'm lucky if I can ever get a photo of my kids on my phone and definitely none on my camera yeah (laughs) natural progression yeah they tend to uh, shy away from it a little bit later in life I know I've got uh albums full of them as uh, babies and all the way up to about five or six yeah seven or eight and that's where they start to dodge and weave yeah. and want, <laughs> want to not be a part of the photo totally <laughs> so what place does photography have in your life what does it mean to you I'm going to say it's not the most important thing because otherwise my family will kill me. My family's pretty important to me, um, but photography comes a close second and it's actually my full-time job. So I guess I'm quite lucky to do something that I love. I've come from out of a role of being a corporate accountant for many years and a bit of a, a bit of a lifestyle change to go from a very technical number crunching role into something that's a bit more creative. But if I'm honest, I always had some sort of level of creativity whether it was poet writing poetry or playing music and things I came to I fell into the accounting and I wouldn't say I was a natural accountant so I think I've always had that creative side and just picking up a camera and seeing what you could create and also capturing a moment of when you're out out and about in the outdoors we're so lucky here in New Zealand to have probably I would argue the best landscapes in the world when you think about how much variety there is in a small little island nation like we are so I couldn't have picked a nicer place to to want to hone my craft definitely it's I I think one of the attractions of New Zealand is that it is so compact Mm -hmm. and you can drive sort of coast to coast east coast to west coast in a few hours try and do that here in Australia and it's more like (laughs) a few days or weeks depending on how (laughs) how you choose to travel but it's yeah and and as you say the variety is just amazing Mm -hmm. Uh, so what is it about landscapes that 
your chasing and motivates you to get out there at silly hours, which was a very common theme for many landscape photographers. Yeah, I love my sleep. So why I picked a passion that involves the early hours is beyond me. Yeah, I, I, landscapes for me is just, I'm just in my absolute happy place when I'm having adventures, when I'm driving around the country, chasing Chasing something you don't even know what you're chasing half the time. You're, you're on your way somewhere and you see a, a bit of light and you've just got to stop and shoot it because it looks amazing. And it wasn't what you intended to do, but often the journey ends up being better than the, the destination or what you were headed for. And yeah, over the years, I think when I first started out in photography, I was about getting the shots in all of the, the, the famous spots, the popular spots. Sure, and sure. Whilst I still do go back to those spots, for example, Araki, time and time again, these days, it's about what can I get that's not the same as what everyone else has. And this moment of light, and I find myself more and more, I used to struggle for using my telephoto lens because I'm just, I love the big wide landscapes. But over the years, I've tried to force myself to start to hone in on some of those smaller details because often those can be the images that really speak to people more when there's less going on in the image than, you know, everything going on. You can have amazing, amazing scenes with lakes and mountains and reflections and cool clouds and trees and everything going on but sometimes those really small little intimate moments can actually really speak to you um, more than the grand landscapes do. Mm, yeah I think you, you're quite right it's uh, a lot of landscape photography certainly for me anyway is about what you don't include as much as what you do and it's quite a it, hard lesson to learn. You ab know? Absolutely. Yes. And it, it, it's making those choices. I, I actually uh, threw something up on, on Twitter yesterday, uh, which was a, a shot taken on a um, mill lens. I didn't have my two times converter, so I couldn't go to 400. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a really bright sky above a dark layer of cloud. And so to frame it, I didn't want that bright sky. I wanted the gloominess of the dark cloud. So I ended up with a, a lot of water in the foreground that I didn't really want the end shot. And mm. I've actually spent the last couple of days just trying to work out how to crop it and leave out what I don't want and keep in what I do. As, as you say, those decisions that you have to make are, uh, are really hard. One of the things I'm interested in is what's your thought process when you're going through that? decision making whether it's in the studio and cropping post processing or whether it's in the field and trying to frame up the image in the camera yeah there's definitely an element of getting that framing right in camera because often that will help so much when it comes to the editing process particularly around not having distractions I'm a real um, proponent of looking through the viewfinder not just relying on the screen because the number of times I've been caught out I'll have shot for 20 minutes, half an hour in a particular place. And then I'll look through my viewfinder and I go, oh, I did not see that stick in the corner of the shot. Like it's been there the whole time. Yep. Yeah, just in terms of, and, and just making sure that I'm always thinking about what is in the edges of my image. What, what is it adding or is it detracting? Is there something that's drawing us the eye into the image? Are there nice leading lines coming in? That sort of thing. I try not to have to crop too much when I'm doing my editing later, but Ultimately, sometimes you're restricted with your lens choice that you have with you and you then have to make the shot work as you might have envisaged it in the field. You might have been there going, actually, I know I'm going to have to crop this because yeah, yeah. 200 mils is my longest and I cannot get closer and I know the shot's going to look better when it's cropped. So it's a little bit of both, but I try as much as possible to have the right lens on at the time for the composition rather than, because I'd love, to, I always like to try and keep as much resolution in the, the shots that I get if I want to sell them, blow them up large. Yeah, that, that that's always a consideration if you're going to try to sell prints or something and you want to blow it up nice and large. Yeah. Yeah. Do you set goals in your photography? And if so, how do you go about it? I definitely have because obviously I've gone from being a corporate accountant to doing part-time photography to full-time photography. And I wouldn't say it's been a smooth road because I decided to go full-time just about as COVID hit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had a few workshops planned that I couldn't do because no, no one was traveling anywhere. Yeah, I, I definitely do have goals. I'm a bit of a, a list writer and a ticker offer of things. I'm actually in a phase right now over summer where I'm not traveling as much. I try to run most of my workshops and things during the sort of autumn, winter, spring, just because the yeah. days aren't quite so long. So I found myself in a position where I'm actually at home 
home for a couple of months, which hardly ever happens. And I've got this big long to-do list of things like I want to rewrite my landscape photography course online because the content's um, a couple of years old now. It's really hard to motivate yourself to do those admin jobs, though, because yeah. I'd far rather be out shooting, but I have been having to force myself to go, no, you've done a lot this year. Think of all the places you've been and all the things you've done. These things are equally as important. Yeah, if you give me a choice and then the scales are there and they go, you could go out and shoot an amazing sunrise tomorrow, or you can spend eight hours rewriting module five of your course, the, the trip outdoors is always going to win every single time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> So do you structure projects in terms of, we can talk a little bit more about how you work the business a, a, a little bit later. I'm interested though, in terms of your own personal photography, do you structure projects around your photography or are you less of a planner and you're more spontaneous in your shooting? Yeah, it depends on, on like a, a lot of the time it's quite, location specific so I've got an idea and go okay I don't really have much content from say I don't know Northland I need to plan a trip to Northland and then what I have things I want to tick off honestly landscape photography is 90% frustration and 10% elation so there's a lot of things on my wish list of places I want to go and the type of shot I've envisaged in my mind that I might be waiting six or seven years <laughs> seven years to shoot <laughs> things like I don't know if you're familiar with Mount Taranaki yeah, so there's a shot at Cape Egmont, which I finally got sunset, but it was about the fifth time I'd been there over the course of about four or five years. So a lot of it is just, yeah, having some goals, but also being flexible enough to let other things dip in and dip out. And yeah, I've got, I, there's more I'd love to learn. Like I've done a lot more in Photoshop recently. I love Lightroom and I think Lightroom's become more and more like Photoshop, but because I do astro stacking and long exposure foregrounds and things like that, I find in focus stacking, I find myself more and more in Photoshop than what I used to. And I would love to learn more on some of the technical stuff. It hasn't held me back at all, but yeah, I think it's, it's knowledge is power and I think it's really important to always feel like you've got something else that you could learn rather than thinking you know it all. I definitely oh, do not know it all. And the thing as well is with often with workshops, I find that I'll actually come away learning something from a participant. And I always say to people at the beginning of the workshops, your goal is to teach me something. Because yeah. I think it's like you can, you can never be that person who thinks they know everything because I really don't. And I actually love it when people teach me stuff. I'm just, I'm all about it. And I think that kind of learning environment, as much as I'm the host, the instructor or whatever, Often there's people who come along who are really technically really good and great photographers, and um, I think it's amazing if they're willing to share their knowledge with the group as well. So. Yeah, I think it's fantastic if you can pick up techniques of of people that you're working with, and it's it's amazing how much I know I've learned from people just from doing a few workshops here and there, and you end up finding out uh, a lot more than. Some of it's a bit about yourself as well. Mm, totally. so I re really enjoy that aspect of it. I'm interested in how you bring your personal expression and your style and your vision into your landscapes. Everyone talks about having a recognisable style and mm. yours is quite recognisable. How did that develop and how how do you see that developing as you as you go through forward yeah I think color would be the word that would describe my style like I'm definitely not one of these people who wants to put a vintage filter on every uh, mountain scene that they come across and um, I'm, I'm about we'll embrace the colors that are there in nature obviously oh, there's a point you can take it um, I, I've seen plenty of people who saturate the hell out the images and it's oh. so it's finding that nice media happy ground where you've brought out the potential of that image but you've not taken it into the completely unbelievable could never have been that color kind of scenario and yeah because I don't I, I love shooting all types of landscapes so you look through some people's Instagram feeds and it's only mountains or it's only sunrises or sunsets yeah, I, love, yeah. I love waterfalls I love astro I love aurora when it happens and so from that point of view each each one of those landscapes has a very different color profile and a very different kind of tonal range and things like that so being able to just bring those out and I just think nature is so beautiful we see I'm always trying to recreate what I've seen but I just put a little bit of a spin on it that is recognizable as being mine and just just really celebrates the beauty that's out there mm -hmm. I think one of the things that many people struggle with, you, you mentioned 
that's a key one and usually uh, a, a fairly rookie error that many people fall into because it's very easy to do and if you don't control how you play with your contrasts and so forth it, it, it can really bend an image out of shape I guess how much of, of your work have you put into making sure that you're staying true to the natural scene as much as possible because when I look at your work as you say it's quite colorful and quite mm. vibrant but mm. it's also very believable that yes I can stand there I can see that and in the same conditions that's what I would see yeah I think I think understanding how to use all the different types of color options available in Lightroom is a really powerful thing it's very easy just to hit the vibrance <laughs> or hit the white balance and be done with it. And I look back at my sort of, and I think a lot of, for a lot of people in their journey of editing, you start from a, a very low base of knowledge and then you, you use the basic panel and you're happy with how that goes. And then you discover presets and you go, oh my God, presets are amazing. Look at what I can do. And they're pretty, preset, often presets will work well for the person who's created the preset on their types of images. And so I, and I look back at some of the images that I still have in my library from, say, six or seven years ago where I might have been using presets, and I go, oh, my God, what was I thinking? Like, I look at the editing now and I go, you know, that is just garish and it's horrendous. But at the time, I thought I was had done an amazing job. And then I think you reach the top of that preset plateau and you come down the other side of it and go, hang on a minute, I think I could actually probably get to this as good a result, if not better, if I just understood all the different tools that are available. I really enjoy using the, the HSL panel just to make individual colours pop because it's then you're actually enhancing your skies or your greens in the forest without buying the entire image with, with too much saturation, a bit of colour calibration. I don't use a lot of colour grading. Very occasionally I will. I know a lot of people spend a lot of time cooling down there. Uh, shadows and warming up their highlights and things but sure, sure. Um, it's not really my style so it has to be the right kind of image for me to go hmm, I'm going to use it in this particular shot yeah. yeah I guess I'm interested in how you have worked with experimentation with new ideas and techniques in the field as opposed to things that you might be doing in in post-processing what sort of inspirations have come to you and said, all right, well, I'm going to try this. And I guess with experimentation comes failure sometimes. Uh, how do you deal with that failure in the event that the experiment hasn't worked? This feels like my entire astro journey, <laughs> what you've just said. Um, <laughs> Isn't it everybody's astro uh, journey? <laughs> oh, I think... Like landscapes can be so incredibly rewarding if you turn up on a particular morning and you get up for sunrise and you make the effort and you get rewarded with this beautiful light, beautiful scene, and you come up, you know when you've taken, you've, you've snapped that shot, you know that you've come away with something that you're going to, oh, sometimes I'm hallelujahing at the back of the camera going, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Astro, on the other hand, is a real exercise in patience and multiple failures. And I don't know if it's just because it's more technical, but also you don't you can't really tell from the back of the camera whether you're going to actually have anything that's going to work until you get it back and start processing it. I've still got a lot to learn with Astro, and I do teach it, but to an intermediate level. I look at some of the amazing Astro photographers we've got out there, and I'm just not sure if I've ever I'm ever going to be willing to put the out like all nighters in for long periods of time I've done one all nighter for Astro and it nearly killed me it took me about two weeks to get over it so for me trying to maximize my time when I'm out on the field and go right today I'm going to shoot two two different images do some stacking I don't have a tracker so I have to stack do some stacking and then do a long exposure go home and hope like hell it works but inevitably there there'll be something that was wrong with it that you can't tell because it was dark and I actually, uh, I can't remember who I was saying this to the other day, but it's the learning and the failures are actually more important than things going right, to be honest. Ultimately, very frustrating if you're just in that one place and you're not planning on going back again anytime soon if yeah. you haven't managed to nail the shot. But yeah, I, of, often I think those are the things that kind of define you, whether you're wanting to go back and try again and do better next time rather than just going, oh, I can't do Astro, I'm giving up altogether. I don't think anyone should give up necessarily and not unless they're just never going to put the, the time and effort into it. But, yeah, it, it, that 
that sense of not giving up is mm. something that I think is really key mm. to success. What do you feel is the key to your success and what does success look like for you in your photography? For me, I think I've got some friends who are more talented than me, better photographers, but I think sometimes people can be so hard on themselves and not willing to accept anything less than 100% perfection literally sitting there and feeling like oh, I can't post this on Instagram because it's not perfect and then they don't post at all I'm like a bit of an 80 20 rule like it, if it's 80 percent there yeah okay it might have a, a little flaw but who's gonna who's gonna know better just get it out there and get it into the world than it being absolutely perfect and I think like giving up a secure corporate job to head into a creative field where there's a lot of at, at risk basically I'm the one that has to make my own income It'd be very easy to get paralyzed with the, I'm not good enough. What if this doesn't work? That kind of thing. But I think, I don't know, my husband would say I'm a realist. He's definitely an optimist. So I'm definitely got a balance of, I can, I can definitely have moments where I'm like, oh, this isn't going so well. But I think on the moat, for the most part, I'm definitely more a positive, upbeat, positive person. I think just having to go, just saying, what is the worst that can happen? What, if this messes up, what is the worst that can happen? Because if you're constantly thinking about the worst that can happen, then you probably will never do something. You'll just sit at home That's and right. be yeah. too scared to leave the house. And I've had some some things that haven't been gone as well as they could have, but other things that have gone much better. And I just, for me, success is when I absolutely love running the workshops. I just love getting like-minded people together and just hanging out and making it a real experience for them and helping them improve their skills, but also experiencing the beauty of New Zealand as we do it, which is just as important. And for me, success is getting to the end of the workshop and people being absolutely buzzing, who have maybe just haven't picked up their camera much and are now just completely inspired to get out there and try some new things. And I'm definitely not going to have taught them all I know, but even if I've just done a little bit of a step in their journey along the way, then yeah, I just, that makes me so happy. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Do you like to shoot with other people more than shooting alone or if is it a bit of a mix? A bit of a mix. It tends to be very cyclical. So obviously on workshops, I'm often, sometimes I'm not even, I won't even shoot a sunrise if I'm busy helping people or, oh, or whatever. Okay. And there's people at different age stages of their learning and some people are much need a lot more help, especially on the first few days of a workshop. As a workshop progresses, people tend to like increase in confidence. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, yeah, there's definitely, and I also like to walk up and down and just get people excited about what they're seeing and because I'm always excited. So I like to bring people <laughs> along on the ride with me. But yeah, I also love those times when I do have moments to myself because those are the ones where you just know it's just between you and God or you and nature and they're pretty special too. There's, I think being a woman in photography, there's there's always less, you're less inclined to do a lot of soul. Some people are into it. I still have a healthy sense of not necessarily wanting to push the boundaries of what is safe in terms of being out by myself. So often I'll enjoy having it when it's just me and one other person, which is I've got a friend I do a lot of trips with and we think the same, love the same type of photography. So I feel very lucky to have her. But yeah, I enjoy all, all kinds of it. There's eight, I get something different from each type of scenario. For myself, it's just that whole, I saw this, it was just for me. It's just for me to remember or something that's shared is something that you'll always go back to that. Oh, do you remember when we did this? And it's a cool shared experience. Yeah, sure. I'd like to move on to the lifestyle choice of going full time. How difficult was it to make that choice and how did you go about it? What thought processes were going on when you made the the decision? Yeah, so I was working full time as an accountant, but working in a family business. So I was quite lucky that I had a very heart, honest heart to heart with my brother and said, look, I really would love to give this photography thing a go. I'll never know if I don't do it. I kept saying, everyone said, oh, you should totally go full-time and be a full-time photographer. And I just used to keep saying, the accounting pays the bills, it pays the mortgage, maybe in 10 years' time. I've been saying this for about three or four years, and I thought, God, this is a, such a terrible excuse to not follow my dreams. Really? In 10 years' time, I'm going to be that much older and the joints are going to be creakier and will I really then want to be doing something? So I was just like, nah, I've just got to give it a go. I was very lucky that I was able to phase myself out of the business that I was working in. So I dropped gradually 
And then when COVID hit, luckily I was still working three days a week then. So I was able to continue some work for the business whilst I started building up mine. At that time, I was actually quite lucky that I was contacted by Case Filters. So I've been ambassador and also the distributor here in New Zealand for sort of three and a bit years. So that was really awesome because it's been a really good another feather in my bow in terms of people, often people haven't discovered filters, they discover filters and then they decide to come on a workshop or vice versa, yep. they come on a workshop and then they go, oh, filters are amazing, I want to get some. So that for me, that's been a, a real help and it was also a real good basis. So I had to build the business up, of course, but that was great just in that it was underpinned some of the other cyclical work, which is a bit seasonal and only happens when I choose to run a workshop, for example. Yeah, yeah. What does a workshop with Megan Maloney look like? Oh, it kind of depends. So I will usually do a range throughout the year and I try and run different workshops in different places around New Zealand so that I'm not going always going back to the same place. I know you've, I think you've had a podcast with Rachel Gillespie yep. um, before. So we always run one one or two together a year. So we usually run, run one in Mackenzie in autumn, which is usually three, four, well, actually four days, three nights. And then I will normally have a couple of others that are four day, three nights. And then I normally try and do one longer one during the winter, which mm -hmm. next year is solely based on the West Coast. But yeah, I just, and I think I get people who come back regularly and I think that's because A, they enjoy them, but B, they're like, oh, I haven't been there and this year Megan's going there, so I'm going to go there. So that's been really awesome. And I guess for me, the one good thing about COVID was that we had a lot of Kiwis here in the country with cameras who couldn't travel, who wanted to learn how to be better photographers. So there was no lack of no lack of clientele in a way, even though we had no international travellers, because Kiwis actually just wanted to get out there and see the country sure. and learn. Probably good for them too, getting out there without all the international tourists around. <laughs> yeah, I have to say it's quite it's been quite noticeable this year. I think it was our autumn workshop this year. We went into Araki for the day and just at that Whitehorse Hill car park, which is like the main car park where you do the walk to Hooker Lake and I even pre-COVID I had never seen it that busy there were cars lined up all the way down the road not even like the car park was full to overflowing and I was like wow this is what it's like to have tourists back again I was quite shocked actually and I'm not I'm certainly not anti the, the tourism industry it's a very important part of our economy and it's and I don't mind having them here and I'm, I just might want to have to share spots with people <laughs> first thing in the morning. When I say that, though, we're still incredibly lucky, apart from perhaps the Wanaka tree, you're really not going to have to fight and jostle. For not shoulder to shoulder with it. No, I'm actually headed off to Iceland in March and I'm already trying to psych myself up for the fact that it's not going to be like it is here in New Zealand and there's probably going to be some shoulder to shoulder. I'll just get really good at, just need to improve my, my shoulder muscles so I can <laughs> barge people out of the way. I'm interested in people's personal brand and the wearing of the many hats that you have to wear. Mm. Your background in accounting is obviously going to be an advantage in some of those aspects but uh how do you deal with the marketing side and how a lot of photographers are introverted and therefore don't like spruiking their work and talking about themselves etc how important is it to get out there and get your name out oh super important but yeah if you're a highly introverted person it's just makes it that much harder so I'm a Sony ambassador here in New Zealand and so part of my role here is to run I run about eight, seven or eight events a year some of those are online through zoom some of those are in person um, and I also talk at a lot of camera clubs and that often leads people to then book, book on workshops with me I've always enjoyed to a, like public speaking just to like doing speeches and stuff at school so I guess that's been a, a sort of an, an advantage from that point of view I still get nervous when I have to stand up in front of people but I actually really afterwards I'm always quite buoyed and amped by the experience and then in terms of the marketing so I do a lot of it myself in terms of the so for the filters I'm often like doing ads for sales and things like that and I've been on Instagram and Facebook a really long time back from when everybody it was growth city and you could yep. get a thousand new followers a, a day pretty much but I do have a couple of people, external people who help me. I've got someone who helps me with my Facebook ads because they, they're, the, they're the experts in that field. And I've got someone who helps me with Google ads as well. So I think it's really easy to think, oh, I'll just do it on myself. How hard can it be? But actually, if you've got people who are experts at what they do, they're going to 
be it's going to be more beneficial in terms of getting the right SEO and the right traffic to your site and things like that. And so yes, you might have to pay for the privilege, but you actually reap the rewards from doing that and using people who are that's what they do all day, every day. It's only part of what I do. The old Instagram post, I'm not definitely no Instagram guru. And so why not use people who actually can get you the results that you want? Yeah. Okay. That's great advice. What do you think is your biggest challenge in balancing work, photography, workshops and family? Oh, don't even get me started. Both <laughs> my boys play football at a really, this is soccer, play football at a really high level. So last year from sort of April through to September, and my husband was playing too when he didn't have a broken arm, we had five games of football a weekend and I think four practices a week. And so I'm away quite a lot between April to September. So I find it really hard to miss those moments because I know that they aren't going to be, the kids aren't going to be at home forever. I hate missing any games, but I just have to resign myself to the fact that the profession I've chosen requires me to potentially be away almost every other weekend through that same time. So mm. I just try and make the most of being mum taxi service during the week because I'm often away on weekends and things as well. And any game I can get to as a bonus. And that's why recently I actually went over to Melbourne when my youngest played in a tournament. Because I didn't get to do all of that stuff during the year for, for, for the games, it was really important for me to actually put the, the set that time aside and go, no, I'm going to come and support you in, in that. Uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty understanding, I have to say. I mean, they're, they're at an age where they know that this is what I do and what I love and and they can really look after themselves and it's not even as a hubby needs to be home now because they're pretty independent. But yeah, it's just about taking those moments when we do have them. We've booked to do. We've booked to walk the Kepler track in April as a family with a couple of friends. And it might not be their, exactly their idea of a really happening fun time, but I know that they'll appreciate it afterwards, that we've got this family memory together, all of us. And yeah, I think it's just about all those little moments that you do have, making the most of them so that when I am away for long stretches of time, it's not like, mum, who are you? <laughs> it is a juggle and it's always something I, I think I will always struggle with because... I know a lot of people who have families and they're never home and they travel overseas all the time. And I enjoy the travel, but I absolutely love coming home and being at home. So I love both those parts of my life equally, which I guess is a good thing because I, I look forward to being away, but I really look forward to coming home. Nice, nice. One thing a lot of people struggle with is pricing of their work. How do you work out how to price what you're doing? It is. That is a very good question. And you know what? I get a lot of people asking me for advice on Instagram about this as well, because they might have just been asked by someone for the first time. Yep. A commercial. Go and do a shoot yeah. for an event or something like that. Yeah. 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 Or so and so, this particular council, this particular tourism board wants some images. How should I price it? And mm -hmm. I, I normally just, I, I, I never will just give them a number and I would say, look, tell me a little bit more about the project. What are they asking for? What are the rights involved? How long do they want it for? How many images do they want? What would you realistically be happy with too? Like, and a lot of people would probably price themselves too low. And I've got to say, you've got to value the work that you do and, and not undersell yourself too. Because once you've, sometimes if you set a precedent that's too low, then you've got, it's very hard to, and I think over time, I've definitely increased my pricing. I think doing a lot of online reviews used to be but what it's called now, but it doesn't, I don't think it actually works anymore, but there was an online digital imaging calculator. Yeah. This yeah. one maybe? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, remember using it a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. So that sort of thing is, I, I think their ballpark was like probably three or four times more than what you'd realistically be able to ask for here in New yeah. Zealand. Well, at least gave you some, something to work to. Yeah. You know, and often, you know, I, I, there's definitely work I don't get because I say, this is my price and people will go, oh, but we're just a charity and we can't afford blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, and I've already discounted it anyway, knowing that they might be a not for profit. Sure, sure. And so, I guess you just have to be, you, you have to price it at a point where you're happy that if they walk away, you feel like you've not, you've not overpriced it, but you've not undervalued your, your work either. Because there's times I really want to write that big, long email back that says things like, so if you knew how much, how many thousands of dollars I have invested in my gear and the petrol it took me to drive to this place or fly to this place yeah. and drive to this place, that's a thousand kilometers away. And I was and there the accommodation five, five years. 
Yeah, yeah, all of that sort of stuff. But yeah, unfortunately, for us photographers are somewhat undervalued as a whole. I think, unfortunately. Just, just um, yeah, I, I love the the uh, we'll pay you with exposure attempts that. Uh, the problem is, is, is that some people often. are actually you know, people are younger in their journey sure. as a photographer, and they love that idea. So. Yeah, I kind of got to the point where I have to politely say, unfortunately, exposure doesn't feed my children. That's it. Um, in a nice way. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that is always interesting to me is the, I guess, the nexus between where you live, where you like to shoot, uh, what you shoot, but also how you shoot and whether or not any of those elements influences the other particularly around how you shoot? Yeah, so unfortunately I live in the North Island and my favourite places are a plane right away. So I spend, that's why I spend a lot of the from winter, spring away. Yeah. Makato is great. I love living here. It's very green, rolling hills. Sometimes I look at the shots I have from the Waikato and feel like I've done the place to death and there's nowhere else to shoot, which is completely stupid because I know that there are other places I haven't discovered yet. And I've got my favourites I keep going back to. But, yeah, I'm a sucker for mountains and lakes. And I guess the one thing we do, the one thing I do enjoy up here is shooting beaches and waterfalls, whereas when I'm down south, it's more about chasing the mountains and the lakes, that kind of thing. So it's Good to live somewhere where you've got one type of thing for the summer and that, and then to be able to do all the travel in the winter. Yeah, I just said I would love to be more, be able to get out more and do more off off the remoter adventures. Mm -hmm. But I've also got to be realistic in that I'm forty something, moderately fit. No, I mean I'm okay, but I can't. I'm not someone who could hike with twenty five kilos go into a remote hut that's three days walk away just to get a shot I just can't do that it's just not yeah. me I, I want to be able to do it the mind is willing the body is not <laughs> so with that in mind I always have to try and structure adventures that are, feel like they're at the limit of where I'm comfortable at it's going to push me physically and let me a little bit mentally to get to get there and enjoy the reward and enjoy the experience but not be so stupid to think that I can do something that I can't just mm, have to be yeah. realistic yeah, anything that involves ice climbing is completely out. <laughs> so what is your favourite spot? You mentioned Waikato. Is there a spot that just keeps calling you back in that area or any other area for that matter? Yeah, like I said, I, if you said to, if you gave me a no budget, no issues, no travel, no time restrictions, you can go shoot. I'll be in the South Island in oh, five minutes. Okay. There's just no no argument there. But I love Araki area and I love Fjordland. Those are probably my two favourites. And I can keep going back to those and, and never feel like I've done the place to death. I've still got some unfinished business with some astro at Hooker Lake. And I haven't been to Dusky Sound, although one of my workshops next year, I've hopefully got a helicopter flight getting into Dusky. So that'll be cool to see that. Right. But, but there's the this year in... August trip yeah August trip with my friend we actually got up to Chancellor Hut which is above Fox Glacier we hallied up there got a little bit more than we bargained for because when we turned up to check in for the heli flight the guys said so hopefully you are aware of the fact there's probably going to be thigh deep snow up there and we were like yeah no we weren't really prepared for that <laughs> so after they dropped us off and you couldn't even see the steps down to the hut and we were dragging our packs and our photography gear through just like crunching through this super deep snow we just looked at each other and went what the hell have we done because we're up here for the night there's no heating in the hut there's a radio so you can radio in the next morning or if anything happened Oof. but yeah it was certainly a little bit more of an adventure than we'd planned in some ways it was a the, the, the shots we got were awesome we did some astro in that as well but it was also quite hard to move around in that much snow even getting a hundred meters back behind the hut to get the hut in the shot for sunset was like 20 minutes of like literally cutting steps into the snow but ones like that I will remember forever and they're, they're often the ones where you were you get more of an adventure than you planned for so yeah I've got too many places to to have a favorite but Araki Fjordland probably Nugget Point for Lighthouse and uh, sort of yep. 
coastal in there like I said it's probably about as far away from home as I can get in New Zealand I've been there something like six or seven times in about eight years and then also Lake Matheson on the west coast is a bit of a fave too but yeah I've got I think a lot of the time I get inspired by seeing adventures other people have done and go oh, I want to put that on my bucket list this year I finally got to Lake Danielle which is in the Lewis Pass been trying to do an overnight hike there for about two winters and just the, the weather was never any good it's time we finally got actually the, the last trip we did we actually managed to tick off quite a few things that we have on a joint bucket list of places we wanted to go did involve driving ridiculous distances to do it but that's pretty much part of the course when you're chasing landscapes is there a spot that you'd like to retire at that you've shot it yeah i think I'm not sure my husband agrees with this because he quite likes where we live, but I would probably the two places in the country or down in the South Island that I would choose to live is Twizel or Tiarnau. And that's just not because of the, the towns themselves, but it's the proximity to all the scenery. And the fact that you can live in Twizel and be 40 minutes up to Araki Mount Cook, the fact that you can, you're in Tiarnau and you can be in Milford Sound in an hour, both of those places appeal for different reasons. I feel like there is a, there will be a South Island stint in my future, probably possibly not for another 10 or 15 years, but yeah, definitely at some point I would like to actually just be there for a few, good two or three years at least and just see all the seasons because I'm dipping in and dipping out on a weekend, but I'm not necessarily getting to experience all that there is good about it. Although I know Twizel often suffers through weeks of poor frost and fog and people get very depressed. So I'll have to I'll have to just think about that one a little bit more. That sounds sounds marvelous though. Mm. <laughs> What's your most memorable experience out shooting? Oh goodness, that is tough. There's there's been so many. I think the one of the one of the ones I always come back to is an, uh, an overnight up at the Puakai Tan in Taranaki. And we walked up after dark, so I don't necessarily love hiking in the dark, but it was like a two and a half hour hike up, up the, some steps in the dark, stayed the night and got a really beautiful golden light at sunrise, which was an image that then was in the Sony Alpha Awards for landscape um, category in 2018. And I was really lucky that they, this was pre-COVID and so they were still having an event and the images were all on display in Sydney in this warehouse, large, like 2.25 metre canvas. And they said afterwards, do you want that image? And I was like, yeah, I don't know where I'll put it. I don't even think I've got a wall big enough for my house for it. But yeah, I'll have it, of course. And actually, we've built, since built a new house and I've made an entranceway that was exactly the right size for that canvas. But I think for me, the reason that one is so memorable is that like you've put the hard yards and you've driven three hours and you've walked up in the dark and you've got up in the morning and seen this beautiful scene. But also the where was important to me because both sides of my family are from Taranaki and my granddad had climbed Taranaki multiple times. My dad's climbed it a lot too. And to have an image from there that was, and it was a couple of years after I'd lost my last grandparent. They were all, they all lived in Taranaki. So the fact that I've now got that, and it's, it's actually the only image of my photography that I have on in our house at all at the moment. I've got a frame TV that's got some of the images that go round and round on a slideshow. But that one is, I think will always be super special to me. A, because it was like a bit of a starting point in, Sony becoming aware of me and so that kind of led into the ambassadorship eventually sure but also the fact that it was from a region where I've never lived in Taranaki but all my life we went there for holidays and spent time with the grandparents and my dad took us hiking up on the mountain and so for me it doesn't probably really matter where I live or in the country Taranaki will always feel like where my roots are where I'm from yeah yeah cool cool what about horror stories Oh, things like what? Forgetting to t t take your, len your um, lens off of auto and sorry, manual after an astro shoot and shooting a beautiful sunrise and realizing that everything is out of focus when you get home. I've yeah, done that a few times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably one of the harder, harder, it was not so much a horror story, but just a hard yakka stories. I walked the route burn with my husband in 2019. Mm -hmm. so I've done the route burn and the Milford, so the, we're doing the Kepler, as I said, this coming year. And I didn't do the right kind of hiking for the the elevation. I just thought putting my pack on my back and walking around Cambridge around the river and doing a bit of elevation would be enough for the amount of up and down we were doing. And it really wasn't. And I was actually in a really bad way after the first day. And mm, okay. I'd done like of the 32 kilometers I'd done. I, we did a bit extra because we went up to Key Summit, but pretty much was crippled by the time I got to the hut. 
And I just remember saying to my husband, I actually don't think I can do this. I just don't know how I'm going to walk these next two days. And he said something, and he'll probably kill me for saying this, but he said something like, I'm not effing helicoptering you out of here, so you're just going to have to suck it up. But again, so the next day, we was my first half of the second day was uphill, and that was fine. But I was, yeah, to the point, I had walking poles as well, so it wasn't yep. like I was without those. But the second half of the second day was all downhill, and the third day was all downhill, and the downhill was what was killing the backs of my knees. And we were not that far from the Rootburn hut, and my hubby was walking behind me and I was basically stiff-legged and I don't know if you've watched there's something about Mary with you've got Cameron Diaz as the main yep. character and then he's, she's got that guy with the glasses and he walks funny like basically stiff-legged and he was likening me to I think his name's Tucker in the movie and he was taking the mickey out of me on the GoPro and I was just I was so miserable and I was just like I can't believe you're making fun of of how absolutely miserable I am right now and then to the point where when we got to the Rootburn hut, there's a helicopter pad, which has got a beautiful view of the valley. And I dragged myself up there using my tripod as a kind of a walking pole for sunset and got some nice pastel colours. And then the next morning, I was going to the toilet like super early and I could see this crazy red glow in the sky. And I hadn't really planned to get up for sunrise, but I was like, oh my gosh. And I was trying to make not like not much noise because everyone else in the hut's still asleep. And I grabbed my camera grabbed the tripod and almost crawled my way back up to the helicopter pad because I'm so stiff and I'm sitting there and I've got myself all set up and I can tell it's going to be amazing and then I look at my camera and it's like on two percent battery and I'm like anyway luckily for me I think my husband had heard me get up so he, he appeared in on the balcony and I just yelled at him like I was probably about three or four hundred meters away I was just like I made a <laughs> anyway he, he, he came up he arrived up about three or four minutes later with a battery and saved the day and I managed to get my sunrise and then I just kind of basically had to crawl slash hobble the last eight kilometers out yeah it was one of those worst three days of my life bath but but the, the scenery itself was epic and um, ever since then I've had a bit of a phobia about getting myself into a position where I can't walk out of somewhere so I, I probably overtrain for things now because I just never want to go through that kind of experience again the things now, we do for our photography I tell you <laughs> I think you might actually make a really good point there about the preparation and a lot of people I think when they go out into and it doesn't even have to be actual real wilderness but mm. in just some of the people I see walking around national parks I saw a guy up in Queensland and only a couple of k's walk so it wasn't a big walk it was a nice path and everything except leeches everywhere and he's walking down the track with his tent and everything on his back so he's obviously going to go down and camp somewhere down there but he's walking in sandals mm. without any kind of other protection and we picked him up before he got to the area where the leeches were and I said you might want to change your shoes and he said no I'll be right okay <laughs> at least you feel like you've done your part stupid <laughs> as a stupid does sometimes you can only provide advice you can't change people's minds completely we have that happen all the time here in New Zealand the Tongariro Alpine Crossing here which is a one day well, people are forever getting rescued off of that because they just don't understand the risks. They don't understand yeah. that. It's... Even just not taking enough water, even just on a short walk, it, it's, it just blows my mind that, uh, yeah. that people don't think about that stuff before they set off. Yeah. Uh, what have you learned about the world through photography? Oh, I've learned that it's a very big place and there's a lot of places I want to see and I'm probably not going to see them all in the time I have left. So I have to prioritise. Yeah, and I think like as a young person, I loved, I mean, I lived in London for three years and I travelled a little bit in Europe and I loved going to all the cities and exploring and seeing all of that kind of thing. But the the older I get, the more I become like a hermit and that I just want to visit all the places where there are no people. I don't mind the odd person. I love striking up conversations with randoms that I meet when I'm out shooting. Oh, sure. But me and a couple of other people, that's cool. Me and 50 million people all in the same spot, not so much. So I'm just going to try and spend the rest of my days trying to experience places where the scenery is jaw-dropping and I can feel at one with nature and closer to God. And yeah, we 
the Dolomites is another big one, which is on my hit list after Iceland. And the Iceland trip's been a long time coming. And I, I feel like I should have done it about eight, not eight years ago, probably before it got as popular as it is now. But it's still going to be pretty epic. And I, I can't, when I get home from an adventure, I have to plan another adventure. Like the first thing I do within a day or two of getting back from something is what is next? What can I book? Where am I going to go? It doesn't matter if I have to wait two years to go and do that thing I just always have to have that thing to look forward to yeah and I think that generally gets you through the mundane day-to-day the the kids forgetting their lunch the dog eating their homework whatever all of those day-to-day things so long as you've got that thing to attain for to look forward to can get you through a lot of just the the, as I said the mundane day-to-day where things aren't as exciting yeah absolutely yeah What do you do when you're getting back from a shoot? You drop the bags, put the card into the computer, get everything loaded up and start editing? Or do you let it sit for a while and it just sits there and you get to it later? Yeah, I've... To be honest, the the more I've been out, tra- like the more I've run workshops and the more I've been out travelling, the worse I've got at this. Part of that is because... On my camera, I can connect into my phone. So quite often what I'll do is I'll look on the back of my camera at my favorite, what I think are my favorite images, drop them onto my phone, do a quick little edit in Lightroom Mobile. That's generally what you'll see on my stories. It's not war files. That's just the, hey, I was here this morning. This is beautiful, blah, blah, blah. So the downside with that is that you feel like you've done editing when you really haven't at all. (laughs) And so often I will come back from a, a shoot and like I'll be about to go out somewhere and I'll go look at my memory card and go, oh my God, I haven't even downloaded my images from three weeks ago. <laughs> how bad is that? And I'd like if you saw my in my Lightroom image library, you'd be horrified at how many unedited images I have from the last few years. I'm trying to do a big cull, but I never seem to catch up on myself. I think what makes it worse is as you become slightly more technically proficient and you're doing things like panoramas and exposure bracketing and focus stacking, you don't just come home with 10 of your favorite images from a shoot. It's 10 times 10 because you've done all these other things that you then have to go back and edit. So that just adds to the noise of how much how much there is to, to do when you get back. I generally will try and the, the images that I've probably liked on my phone or done a quick edit on my phone, are those are generally the first ones I'll go to in my Lightroom because they sit side by side. I, the JPEG that's been edited syncs. So then when I look at that raw file, it's usually a good starting point. But yeah, I have been known to find images that I was like, oh, I didn't even know I had this, which is not a very good workflow. I always say to my workshop attendees, do as I do as I say and not as I do. do, Look, I have a lot, I work off of collections in Lightroom and that works for me quite well. So I have like regional collections, but also client collections, trip collections. And so I can actually find stuff and I have a lot of it synced to my phone. So I can find stuff super quick. But in the background, there is absolute chaos, which no one ever gets to see. I just just sits in the back of my brain gnawing at me going, you've still got 15,000 images to edit from this year. What are you doing talking to me then? Yeah, totally. (laughs) It is one of my to-do lists for the summer is to uh, cull my my library a bit. Fantastic. How did you, obviously not the, the chaos side of things, but how did you learn your processing and your uh, photography and one of the things I'm really interested in understanding is whether or not you shoot for how you edit or whether you edit for how you shoot which Mm -hmm. drives the other. I think I shoot just how I see and the editing is how I feel when I come to look at the shot. Yeah that's a great answer I love that. Yeah, so because I know for a fact that I have sometimes come back to an image a year later and I've edited it completely differently. Yep. You know, because of, I feel differently at the time and maybe my skills have changed, maybe Lightroom's done an update and the masking is better or whatever, which sure. has happened. In fact, yesterday I was playing with an image from Kate Rianga, which I took back in 2019. And it's an image I've always really loved. It was golden hour, the lighthouse is bathed in light and there's these beautiful golden clouds the grass looks great and there's a whole ton of people in that shot someone's pointing at the there's like a sign that tells you how far away you are in the world from a bunch of places and there's yeah there's probably about four or five groups of people in that shot and I've just always been 
I can't do anything with this shot. I love the shot, so I've never deleted it, but I was like, I can't do anything with this shot because it's just too many people. Cloning doesn't work. Even the content and wear in Photoshop's not the greatest. Enter AI. I tell you, honestly, I did it yesterday. It took me three or four minutes and I was like, holy moly, you would never know there was people in that shot now. And I know we don't need to get into the whole AI thing, but if for nothing else, I love the the changes that have been made this year because it's just meant that I was standing in Rotorua during the year, it's a big long path with these trees on either side and it's about a 500 metre, if not a kilometre path the chances of getting a shot without anyone on that path ever, doesn't matter whether you're there at 7, 7 a.m., 7 p.m., midday, quite yeah. quite rare. And so in the end, when I was on this workshop, I just took a shot. But it did such a good job of getting rid of the people and making it look like it was just a beautiful landscape. And yeah, I feel like I maybe got digressed a little bit there. Edit from, for the shoot, no. I think I just shoot what I see and hope that when I get back I can recreate what I saw with my eyes and that might look different today than what it would do if I edited the same shot in a year's time yeah sure what about where uh learning came from was it something that went out it was the first part of the question that's all right I'd I'd almost forgotten as well (laughs) all self-taught pretty much learned off of other people learned off of YouTube I do try and as soon as the updates come out in Lightroom, I always try and watch the tutorials and see what's new and how to use it and things like that. So I should try and be a bit of a head of the game there. But yeah, I have watched a few. There's a few people who I really enjoy watching on YouTube that I will watch from time to time. But most of it is just self-taught and just making mistakes and Mm -hmm. learning from those and going back and refining down the track. I think it's really important, no matter how skilled a photographer you are, to always go back and revisit some of your older work and see if, like I said, with that image with the removing the people from the lighthouse, you've probably got stuff that's traditionally quite good. That might have been something that you couldn't quite get right at the time. That with the knowledge you have now, it's worth revisiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone occasionally comes up with those times when they're not feeling their photography. How do you deal with those times and overcome the challenges of not wanting to go out or not wanting to edit or not wanting to do something in your photography? How, how do you put yourself out of the rut and say, all right, Megan, back on the horse, we've got to get going? I think because I have, like I said, it's quite a cyclical, my, my year's quite cyclical. And so I've got periods of the year where I'm doing a lot of photography and periods like now where I'm not doing a lot of photography. Like I haven't, I'm trying to think, what did I, I did? I, I ran a, a little event on the 11th of November. So what's that? It's like over a month ago. And that's probably the last time I did any kind of landscape photography. I'm, I'm re- shooting a wedding on next Friday, which I do a couple of times a year just to keep my hand in something a different genre. I think it's important not to force yourself because I think the more you try and force yourself to get out of a rut, the worse you can make it. Like just actually being kind enough to yourself to go, okay, you really know you should be out there shooting Astro right now because it's clear skies, it's calm, you get a good shot. But I'm like, oh, it's really warm on the couch and my 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 cup of tea is, is so much more appealing. And just not, I guess not forcing yourself because at the end of the day, if you do it and you, you're out there and you're not loving it, then you're probably just going to make it worse. So I think just generally leaning into it and going, okay, I'm not feeling it right now. I'm probably tired. I've probably been doing too much. I'm just going to give it a break and not push it. And yeah, generally I feel like it just comes right by itself. But I think... Yeah, I think sometimes if you try to force your way through it by just keep doing more and more of the same, you're probably only going to make it worse. Yeah. Um, sometimes a, a change is, or just a break can be all you need mm. just to reset. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing photographers right now? Oh, I wouldn't be. I think most people would say AI if they were. It's, it's quite common, yeah. Yeah, definitely the AI side of things a lot. I'm probably being naive when I say this, but I feel like people buy prints and canvases off of me because they know that I've been there and done that and taken that shot. Um, I've dabbled a little bit on um, Mid Journey and Firefly and trying to basically get it to recreate classic scenes of mine, Mm -hmm. like that one I was talking about at the Puakai Tan and Mount Taranaki. I've I've said, I've given it all the parameters and said, create me this image. 
it doesn't look like Mount Taranaki for a start, although possibly it will get better at that kind of thing. So I'd, I shouldn't. If, if it on... consumes enough images of Mount Taranaki, it'll eventually get Eventually, there. yeah. But yeah, I think, and I think a lot of the time I always try and have, like with my calendar this year, I've t- told the stories behind all the shots and on a, like a double page spread. And I think people often will want to be part of your life, your world of your photography because of the shared experience. They like to live vicariously through you. And I think AI AI will never replace that. And also for me, because workshops are such such a big part of what I do, a robot's not going to be able to engage with people, I would hope, the same way that I can. Not for a while anyway. Not for a while. (laughs) Maybe not in our lifetime, hopefully, that will you know, that, that that can't change that experience, that personal sort of element to it. I do think for photography as a whole, there's some, probably some genres that are looking really risky with AI coming on, product photography and sure, sure. things like that. I'd be much more worried if I was just a commercial photographer taking photos of beer bottles with lovely glistening. Right. I think events and weddings, they're fairly safe. Mm. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I think I think you're right. The product photography and fashion. I think there's or it's already started to to bleed there as marketing departments realise. Oh, I can do this myself. Yeah, yeah. Just by typing a few words. Mm. What do you think the future of photography holds for us? The thing is, that no matter where we end up with AI, and I don't think any of us, no matter how smart we think we are, I don't think any of us can really see where it's going to lead. Mm-hmm. Um, we just have to try and not bury our heads in the sand and actually use it to our advantage. I'm not suggesting we sky replace all our images. I'm not suggesting we should be creating stuff that's not there, but I think for removing people out of an image, I'm all about it. I think we just have to bear in mind that people are always going to want to travel. They're always going to want to take images in beautiful places for their own personal experience and what yeah. that moment meant to them or they want to buy a print off of me because they've seen an image from a place they went. Just recently, I had a girl in Australia buy an image. It is an old image of mine too, but it's because she got proposed to at that spot. And it's got got memories for her. You can't really take that away from from the photography. And I think, and even though maybe in, I don't know, 20 years time, our phones will probably be able to do as good a job as our cameras. There's still some level of skill in the post-processing process that a lot of people aren't really willing to put the time and energy in to learn they're just happy to do their little snaps on their phone and 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 be done with it for me I actually enjoy the editing as much as I enjoy the experience of being out in the field so I think that's where for photographers if you've got if you've got a well-rounded kind of approach where you like the experience but you also want to maximize and post-processing creating something of art then there'll always be a, a role for us landscape photographers I hope Absolutely. I really hope <laughs> <laughs> that's where I'd like us I'd like to us to end up whether it is true or not but I think yeah I think yeah we just have to be open-minded and it's very it's too easy to go oh it's not going to happen to me or I'm just gonna yeah. I'm not even gonna think about AI I don't want to know anything about it but you're forewarned as forearmed you know? absolutely absolutely you mentioned your experience early on with uh Instagram and and social media having been using those tools for so long where do you see their place in the future of photography do you see them sticking around and do you see them making it worse than they already have or do you see them making it better i for 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 me it's definitely a double-edged sword you need it to get your your work out there but it can also be very imposing for somebody just starting out particularly now and particularly the way the algorithms are skewed towards video etc yeah it is a, it's a real tricky one and I guess I'm, I'm just I'm very grateful that I started at the point that I did so that I have a few years of using the, the tool and having a, a okay number of followers and things in the background I can't I can't see a day where Instagram doesn't exist because okay. it's one of the it is one of the big Maybe it's just because it's the one I use, and I same with Facebook. But it's and who knows? We don't know what we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what's not out there at the moment. It'd be great if there could be like one at one sort of platform to rule them all, where it was good for every kind of good for the video, good for the photos, good for catching up with the family or whatever whatever it is you want to do. But yeah, I think competition won't let that happen. To be honest, yeah, it's. I think if you're just starting out, 
I always say to people, because I, I do have a course on getting started selling your photography online. The one thing that people often overlook is the benefit of having your own website and you own that website. So if something happens to Facebook, if something happens to Instagram, you still have your IP somewhere on the internet getting traffic, et cetera. Solely being so single-minded and that you only focus on one platform is pretty it's pretty risky because yep. you don't you don't own Instagram. So anything could happen. I, I don't want it to happen because I've really enjoyed my years on Instagram. And as much as people go on about it, I can't really fault how it's helped my business grow. So from that point of view, I'm always going to be quite grateful for that. But yeah, I think getting your own site out there in the world and always driving stuff back to there rather than just to Instagram for the sake of it is always going to be where people should be putting their best of their endeavors instagram is just a window through to more yeah yeah who do you think i should be talking to on the podcast oh who you have talked to grant probably <laughs> i probably say lots of names of people you've already had on there uh, give it a go and we'll see oh. how we go are you just doing Ki- kiwi aussie or just in anybody anywhere no i've been been global i've done canadians i've done someone from turkey i'm lining up trying to line up some people from scandinavia as well yeah it's landscape photography world for a reason <laughs> mm, totally i'm, I'm a quite a big fan of nigel Danson. yep and mads peter iverson i have to say his work and his guides to iceland have been invaluable for me in planning my trip i think i really resonate with people who what's the word really free and willing to share information because not all landscape photographers are like that you can find people who are hold hold their cards close to their chest they want to keep all the what they know for themselves and I'm just like no I want to get it all out there in the world and the more people learn the more people know the better so I think that's probably why their work resonates with me yeah I'm a big fan of those two and yeah closer to home you have probably interviewed everybody or I already know in the New Zealand photography uh-huh. community but I still think there's a few <laughs> Oh, yeah, probably. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head, though. That's the thing. I'm like putting me on the spot here. Um, no, I can't think. Maybe offline I'll have to send you a message. No worries. That'll be fine. That'll be fine. I've got one more question for you as we wrap up. And for yeah. many of my listeners, it's the most important one I ask. Do you like pineapple on pizza? Yes, I'm a big fan of Hawaiian. Okay. I think I probably like probably like a meat lovers more than Hawaiian, but I definitely don't pick the pineapple off. Yeah. I I don't order it, but if it's there, it's it stays on the pizza and I eat it. Yeah. Um Yeah. It's funny how things can be so polarizing. Absolutely. That's why I asked the question, because uh, I think the the landscape photography community needs to know. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Thank you very much for spending some time with us, Megan. It's been wonderful getting to know you. Where can people find your work? Well, obviously, I've mentioned a few places. I'm on Instagram and Facebook. If you just do at Megan Maloney Photography, and I've got a website which is the same, meganmaloneyphotography.co.nz. I always I say this now, I'm like, I should have really come up with a nice moniker, which was a lot shorter than that, because by the time you've typed all that in, it's quite the mouthful. You should try Grant Swinburne photography. Oh, wait, you and I, if we counted the number of leaders, we're probably almost the same, I would suggest. It'd be pretty close, I reckon. Mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity, Grant. Lovely to chat. Pleasure. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and Facebook. I'm Grant Spinburn. Hope to see you out shooting soon.